evening. Thanks for coming out to learn about your rights as tenants. This workshop is going to be about getting repairs um, and, you know, your sort of legal options and some other alternative methods of asserting your rights to decent housing. Um, so first of all, just to start out, there's something called the warranty of habitability. Oh, let me introduce ourselves. <laughs> My name is Lyndon Miller, I'm a staff attorney at the Community Development Project, and this is my colleague Mike Leonard, also a staff attorney at the Community Development Project. We're part of the Urban Justice Center, and our mission is um, to support organizing. And so we in the Tenants' Rights Unit work with tenant associations um, in lawsuits against the landlords representing them in housing court, um, mostly to get repairs, though we do other litigation as well. Um, okay, now that we've introduced ourselves. Um, so first of all, every residential living space has what's called the warranty of habitability. Okay. And we've made a little um, PowerPoint, so some of this will be up on the screen if it's just easier to read along. Um, so the warranty of habitability promises that the premises will be fit for human habitation and for the uses reasonably intended by the parties. Um, that they won't be dangerous, hazardous, or detri detrimental to tenants' life, health, or safety. So that's um, sort of where this all begins. And it's codified and written down in some different places that go into more detail of what exactly this means, what is required, what the housing standards are. Um, so, First of all, your right to seek repairs, um, you don't have to be the named tenant on the lease. If you're a legal occupant of the apartment, you have a right to uh, seek repairs in the building. So you shouldn't let your name not being on the lease be a barrier. Another thing is that your right to repairs and to habitable living conditions is not connected or dependent upon your payment of rent. So if you're behind in rent, if you haven't paid all of your rent, it's, it's a separate issue from having a right to decent living conditions. Um, okay. So one other thing in addition to the obvious reason of seeking repairs, which is that you need them, you know, in your home, is as a part of the larger sort of tenants' rights, housing rights, um, you know, movement, Asserting your rights strengthens them, and so, and so, just asserting them and going to court and um, you know showing up for yourself in that way like strengthens the system that holds holds landlords accountable for to their tenants and to maintain building uh, buildings and decent um, habitable standards. And in that in that way as well, tenants play a crucial role in maintaining decent housing. So who better than the tenant to know when there's something wrong in the apartment, if there's some um, issues that could be affecting their health, the health of their family in terms of um, mold or pests or even wiring issues or ceiling collapses. These are um, housing, these are um, health issues, these affect the general health of the whole city. And so you asserting your rights to have those issues fixed sort of helps all of us keep the whole housing stock in good repair. Um, and so, yeah, these are, those are sort of touched on as well. So there, if you want to also feel righteous in your seeking of housing repairs, you have our permission to do so. Um, okay. So just to bring up some vocabulary, lawyers throw around a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of acronyms and different words going around. Um, so you'll hear the word violation come up. So the violation refers specifically to violations of the housing code or the building code. There's various codes that regulate the standards of what is habitable and decent housing. And so when, if we talk about housing violations, that means that the condition that exists in your apartment um, is so bad that it breaks some code somewhere, it breaks the law. Um, and then HPD is the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and that's a city agency that is charged with ensuring the health and safety of tenants, and they're the ones who will send inspectors out to inspect and look at conditions and place violations of the Housing Maintenance Code. And you will find those violations um, on the, the HPD's website. And, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, so HPD is the one that they'll come out and they'll do inspections, DHCR, I'm just 
sort of naming two big ones that might come up um, is the Department of Housing Community Renewal, and that's actually a state agency. They administer the rent stabilization laws, um, and they'll come up a little bit later in the presentation. So if you hear us just sort of mentioning those acronyms, I wanted to put those out there. So, you know. But if you hear us saying an acronym and you don't know what it is, just kind of flag it for us. So, so let's talk about complaints. That's kind of what we were getting into a little bit in the audience before. Um, so, on a very basic level, actually, this let's let's back up. It seems like there's some some real experience and real knowledge in the audience tonight. Right? So let's share some of that. So who's so raise your hand if you've been involved. In a, in a housing court case where you know somebody who has been involved in a housing court case, okay? Uh, keep your hand up if you've sued your landlord before. Okay, yeah. Um, raise your hand if you filed a complaint at the DHCR or been involved in some sort of a administrative process at the DHCR, okay? Um, raise your hand if you are involved in a tenant association. Raise your hand if you've been up to Albany this year or plan to go in the coming year when the rent laws are getting reauthorized. All right, cool. So we definitely have some people that are in the thick of it, right, here, because it's a, it's a complicated fight. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of agencies that don't do what we need them to do. So one of the things, when I, so I'm going to talk about making complaints, and it's a very short aspect of this pre presentation, but it's very important. So we wanted to mention it to, to all of you, and also to hear what you think. Um, when we go out to tenant associations, people are asking me the same questions that, that you all are asking me, and they're saying, if I call 311 and I make a complaint with HPD and nothing happens, what is the purpose of making the complaint? Right? And I think that's a really good question. Right? We have to deal with the reality of administrative agencies that are that do their work, you know, supposedly to cite the, the violations, and of course they litigate the violations, they take landlords to court but only a very small part. And mostly what happens is HPD inspectors come and they cite conditions in our apartments. Department of Building uh, inspectors come and they cite um, conditions in the buildings that have to do with building systems, such as roofs and uh, electric, uh, electrical systems and plumbing systems. Um, but what happens once those violations get put up on the board, right? And for a lot of it, the answer is nothing, right? And but why do we still have to do it? Why, do we still, why is it still really important that we call 311 as tenants? Why do I beg my clients to call 311 every tenant meeting I have? Why? Why do I do that? Yes, to show the history, right? Recording the document. If we're going to march into court and we're going to make a case about this stuff, we need to have a paper trail, right? The first thing that a housing court judge is going to ask is how many violations are open in the, in the building. If I don't have a good answer for that, or if you don't have a good answer for that, the case is not going that far, right? The case is, is simply not going that far. So if we, if we, if we, if we have these conditions, it's so, so important that we use the agencies that are out there, as imperfect as they may be, right, but to come in and do their job and document these things, right? Another reason why it's important to document um, housing uh, violations is because the public advocate does a lot of great work with, with, with that, with that uh, information. Has ever, folks have seen the uh, public advocate's landlord uh, watch list? Right? We, so, yeah, so let's, so what, what is that?
offenders when it comes to housing code violations. They look at the violations all across the city and they say, which landlord has the most? Right? And they come up with the top 100 landlords that have you know, 400 violations in their buildings. Right? And what that does is, one, it helps put these, um, these individuals and these companies onto the radar when, when, when community organizers and community groups are out there and they're saying, where can we make the biggest impact in the community when we organize, right? It also puts them into the media, these pro property owners that maintain uh, their buildings in conditions like this. So it is really important to call in the violations. So obviously, like many of us know that 311 is the gateway to all of these agencies. So if you call 311, they can, they can route you to, the, to HPD if you have a problem in your apartment. Um, if the elevator is broken, they will route you to the Department of Buildings. If there's lead dust in the hallways because of uh, aggressive construction that's happening in the building, they'll, um, they will direct you to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, each of these agencies is respectively responsible for citing uh, different kinds of uh, conditions, you know, which, I, which I've just mentioned. Um, so that's a bit about complaints. Do folks know about JustFix? JustFix.nyc? It's, it's really cool. We should all know about it. I, I should use it way more than I do. But um, there was an article in the New York Times um, yesterday. yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. And it was about um, a bunch of um, uh, individuals that use technology to raise up tenants' rights and human rights here in the city. And the way that they do that is they, they are uh, coders, right? They, they um, have created these online platforms to use uh, to use tech basically to record housing code violations to give tenants a way to document them, right? So if you create an account on justfix.nyc, you can, you can have your own account, you can store pictures of conditions in your apartments, um, you, it'll, it'll tell you exactly you know, when and where the picture was taken, so all these things are really good. If you're preparing a case, or if you're trying to, you know, mount a legal defense in court, and you need to document these things, it's not the same as calling 311. Those the violations that get put on JustFix will not result in HPD uh, violations or Department of Building um, violations. Yeah, that's that's really that's a really great f function. Did, did folks hear that? Just Fix will send a certified letter to the landlord of the conditions that are in your apartment. Why is that important? Why is that important? It's a record. It's a record, right? It also puts the landlord on notice. So when I when I when Lyndon and I when we talk to our clients who say who say we want to withhold rent from our landlord as a tactic to get repairs, the first thing that we say is, one, call 311, and then the second thing we say is, make sure your landlord is on notice of these conditions. Notice is incredibly important. Um, so, if nobody has any further questions, that's really what I have to say about recording violations, or if Lyndon wants to Jump in. Sure. Just fix. You can also just go straight to the phone 
and call 311 and have a, have a city inspector come and place, um, place the, uh, you know, um, cite the condition or place the violation in your apartment. I think these things are very um, contextual. They, they depend on the context between or the relationship between the, the tenant and the owner. And it really depends. What is your relationship? If you've never met the owner before and you can never ever get repairs and you think that your letters are just going to a post office box in, in, in Florida, then I, I don't know, maybe if you want to do it, that's fine, but you're probably going to end up having to call 311, you know, so if, they, if the landlord uh, lives on the first floor, you can knock on the door and say, hey, and here's a certified, you know, here's a letter that I'm giving to you and, it, you know, it, it says what we just talked about. I think that's that's also important too. But putting your landlord on notice in a way that you can document is very important, right? So I'm talking about text messages, emails, phone calls to three one one, just fix, um, whatever whatever works, whatever works. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna run through the presentation and then we're gonna get to um, questions. And I want to have a discussion because I feel like this is. Um, a really good audience to be able to do that with. Um, is that okay with folks? If we just okay. So, so like Mike just presented, you have all these um, you have all these conditions documented. You have all these violations. You've been calling three one one. So then, what do you do? If you know, if maybe you let the landlord know there's a problem in my apartment. You've got a great landlord. He comes down and fixes it, and everything's great. That's wonderful. That's best case scenario. So, other scenarios, if that doesn't happen, there's sort of three different legal options um, that we're going to kind of go through. So, one option is called an HP action. And an HP action is a lawsuit brought by either an individual tenant or a group of tenants um, in the building, sort of coming together probably as a tenant association. Um, and you, it's an action that you bring in housing court, and the purpose of the action is to get repairs. So most lawsuits involve money, compensation, damages, different things like that. There's no money involved, you're not getting any money back, the landlord's not going to pay any damages or anything like that, but the goal of an HP action is to get an order from the court forcing the landlord to correct the violations in the apartment or in the building. Um, so we're going to be sort of comparing and contrasting these different legal options because each one has sorts of different pros and cons. So the HP action, one pro is you're on the offense. You're the one bringing the case. The landlord is the one defending himself. Um, you can bring it as a group. Anytime you can do something as a group rather than as an individual, it's going to help level the playing field and helps the tenants have more power to work together as a group. Um, HP action is in housing court, it's called a summary proceeding, and so it's faster than other lawsuits. So this is a relatively um, fast option. Uh, it's available to all tenants in New York City, um, and like I said, if the repair is a violation, a, a code violation, then the judge can order the landlord to fix it. If it's something that's doesn't rise to a violation and is just something that you don't like and want fixed, but the judge, you know, the court finds that it's not actually a legal, something that you're legally entitled to, then um, you may be less successful. Um, so what are the cons? Uh, going to court always is, you know, cost time and energy. Um, you might have to take time off work. Um, if you're not a rent regulated tenant, there are, there's some risks of retaliation, um, you know, it's anytime you take anybody to court, it can have consequences in your relationship with that person, as you can imagine. And so with all of these, like leave it to your best judgment in terms of, of your relationship with your landlord and how you want to navigate that. I think it's up to every single person how they want to figure out how best to navigate that, but also keeping in mind that you do have rights. People bring HP actions all the time um, and asserting your rights you know, strengthens them. Um, but, and then also Connie mentioned that no monetary compensation, it's just to get repairs. So initiating an HP action, this is something that you can do pro se, 
you don't, pro se is a fancy way of saying without a lawyer. Um, so you don't have to be able to afford an attorney to initiate an HP action. Anytime you're in any court, it's always better to have an attorney. Um, but if you can't afford one, which, you know, most people can't, um, this is something that you should be able to do on your own. Um, so basically, here's kind of the steps to do it. You, like I mentioned, like Mike mentioned earlier, once the landlord's on notice of the condition, it hasn't been repaired, you've got that sort of documentation of that back and forth with you and the landlord, or maybe sometimes it's not a back and forth, it's just you telling the landlord. Um, so once it's gotten past that point, you go to the housing court in your borough. Each borough in the city has a different housing court. So you go to the housing court in your borough, you go up to the clerk's window, and you tell them that you want to file an HP action. They'll give you the right papers. You'll fill them out. That's pretty self-explanatory. You can also ask questions. Um, you're going to purchase an index number, which costs, I think, $45 um, in cash. Or you can also ask for what's sort of annoyingly called a poor person's waiver, um, which is another form that you can fill out just sort of explaining that you know you need some um, financial assistance, that the $45 is sort of a burden. Um, and then you will also be given an inspection request form, and this is sort of a more formal way of requesting an inspection of your apartment um, besides the sort of calling 311 and having an inspector come. So you'll schedule an inspection with HPD. Um, after these papers, so then you give these papers back to the clerk, and each borough kind of does it differently. Maybe they'll have you go up um, and bring it to the judge, or maybe they'll send it up, but the judge will sign the papers, um, and they'll, uh, you'll be given copies, and there'll be a return date, so a date for you to return to court, and that'll be your day in court. Um, once you get the, um, the signed copies of the papers back, You'll have, um, you'll have to serve the papers, and there will be specific instructions on how to do this. You'll have to serve your landlord, and you'll have to serve, serve HPD, because as I mentioned earlier, HPD is the city agency that's charged with enforcing the housing maintenance code, um, the housing code, so they have to be involved in these actions. Um, and one other note in terms of serving your landlord, like who is your landlord exactly? You have to, it's not usually like the name of the guy you pay or get rent to, you know. So it's, if you go on um, HPD's website, hpd.gov, you can look up the, the address of your building and it will show you, where are you, it's the, it'll show you the multiple dwelling registration. So it will show you the name of the owner of the building, which was, is usually going to be an LLC. It'll show you the, the head officer, um, the different peoples and entities associated with this building. And those are the people that you're going to be naming in that lawsuit. Um, okay, so that's just getting into court. That's initiating your pro se HP action. Um, so then before your, the date where you return to court, you want to prepare. So that's when you gather all the evidence of the repairs that you need in your apartment. So that's usually taking photographs. Um, you, maybe there's an active leak and you really want to show that you take a video of the leak. I've seen that before. Um, and also the communications with the landlord. So you want to gather all of that evidence together. Um, also that HPD inspection, you want to be there. Somebody over the age of 18 should be home to allow access on the date, you know, the time that's scheduled for the inspection. And usually they give you a window of time. So, and you're also dealing with, you know, city agency. So, yeah. Um, says they're going to be there and nobody shows up, what do you, what do, you do? What do you do, Mike Leonard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, after I cool down from becoming very angry, um, I, I, would call, I would call 311 again, report all the violations over again, right, in a kind of last-ditch attempt to get them to come back before the court date. Sometimes that's not possible. Um, so I do want to, we do want to let people know that the court has the power to order HPD to inspect again. Right? So when you come into court, right, you can say, hey, HPD didn't show up. I want a re-inspection. And the court will make you fill out another form, right, with a 
judge has the power to order that inspection um, all over again, even if they don't really want to. Um, so, and that, that can also be a good thing that you trade in order for giving the other side more time, right? Because obviously the landlord's going to come in and drag their feet and say, oh, wait, wait, I need more time. And you can say, well, if you need more time, then I need to get an inspection in that amount of time, right? You can also ask for other things. But that's one of the things that you can kind of horse trade with the, with the, with the landlord's attorney for more, uh, for more time. Um, so, of the papers that you would use in court? Oh. Sure, we're happy to share our presentation. We can email them. We, we don't have copies tonight, but we can email it around for folks. And I'm... As long as folks sign, signed in and... I believe that after the uh, panel, they said that they were going to um, speak to the different presenters tonight to make sure that we could make our materials available to you. So I think, I'm not sure exactly if it was Senator Kruger's website, but that I think there'll be another way to find it as well. It was Senator Yeah, okay. I think that would be the a less efficient way of doing it. I think we'll, we'll make sure that it's put up on um, wherever the website is, so that the materials are going to be available. And it sounded like that was going to be Senator Kruger's website. So if you just check, check back. Um, we, we, can, we can figure that stuff as, as, the, as the presentation goes on, folks. Let's, let's, um, yeah. let's, let's push forward. Sure, maybe after each topic we could do right. some questions. I just came from the Supreme Court. I went to purchase the index number, uh -huh. and they told me I had to file an Article 78 in order to get the, the okay. index number, and that was very complicated. I mean, I literally can't yeah. share Yeah, so that is, I could see this being a very uh, confusing situation for you, yes. and it's... So I think what you're describing is, it sounded like you were supposed to, or not saying you were supposed to as if you did it wrong, but it sounds like they were saying you had to do an Article 78 to buy an index number, which is a, it's a completely different proceeding, and it's not the same proceeding as this. Housing Court, Supreme Court is much more set up for um, lawyers, and it's, it's much less accessible. Housing Court is much more, I mean, it's still very confusing it's a mess, it's got a lot of issues, I'm not trying to say housing court is a great place, but it is more set up in such a way that um, a, just a tenant going in by themselves should be able to find the window to purchase an index number. And I, it's not the same process as like filing an Article 78 Supreme, so these are very different uh, situations. So this is a, this is a, a case that a tenant or a group of tenants can file in housing court. And so it's not, um, it's not with an agency or not, um, this is just sort of a private lawsuit, but it's sort of a short expedited lawsuit that is brought in just a special court only dedicated to housing issues. So Supreme Court handles all sorts of different issues and has a lot more complicated um, procedures in it. Housing Court is a much more simplified process to a certain extent, and that's specifically what we're talking about is just this HP action that can only be brought in Housing Court. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just keep going, and then maybe we can hold the rest of the questions till the end because I don't want us to get too off track. Um, so where I stopped, it was. You initiated the case, you're gathering, gathering your evidence in preparation for your court date. So the court date will be written on the court papers that, that you received a copy of that was signed by the judge. Um, when you come to court, what you want to bring is your copy of those papers, the affidavits, which is just the written statements saying that you uh, served the papers properly on all of the parties that you sued, which would be the landlord and HPD. Um, you want to bring the evidence of conditions, the photos, the videos, the co correspondence, and you want to, before your court date, go on um, hpd.gov. Is that what it is? Yeah. H the 
HPD's website, if you just go on Google, type in HPD NYC, it'll come up. You want to go on their website, look up your address, and then you want to click on the link for open violations. And that will show you all of the violations that have been placed in your building as a result of the inspection. And so you want to print that out and bring that to you, with you to court because that is, that is what the judge will um, sort of look most closely at and take most seriously as evidence because it means that an inspector went out and they know the housing code, they know what qualifies as um, an infringement of the code and so that's what they are, that's what the judge is seeing is this is what they've found as violations. Um, Another thing on your court date, you want to arrive early. Court, the courthouse is open, or the courtroom's open at 9.30, so you want to be there with them. A lot of times, you have to wait a long line, you have to go through a metal detector, so just know that beforehand. Um, and then most cases, you're going to be talking to the landlord's attorney, and there's going to be um, an agreement to repair it. You always have the right to go in front of the judge. Um, you always have a right to you know, ask for a hearing. You always have a right to, um, you know, you don't have to just, uh, you know, deal with it by yourself in, in, with them. But that how most of these cases end is um, with an agreement to repair or with the judge um, ordering the landlord to fix the conditions. And that, and what Mike was talking about in terms of, you know, if you need a reinspection, if they want more time, these are the sorts of negotiations um, that you can do. But anything that you do sign, any sort of you want to get it so ordered by the judge, and all that means is that you want to, you know, give it to the um, give it to the judge to sign and stamp. Because once the judge has so ordered it, it's now um, like a mandate of the court. It's a little more powerful for something later on if the landlord doesn't actually abide by it. Um, how am I doing? Do you have anything you want to? Okay. So. Oh no, one more. So after court, so usually there'll be an agreement or an order um, to correct the conditions, and there'll be uh, you'll talk about some access dates for them to come do repairs. And so after court, you want to provide access on those agreed upon dates um, because, of course, if you don't, then they get to, that's an excuse. They say, "Oh well, we showed up and she wasn't there." So um, you want to provide access. Um, if they don't show up, you want to. Um, you know, keep records that they didn't show up, you want to write it down, you want to notify them, um, have it known that, they, that they're the ones who didn't comply with the access dates. And then if the repairs aren't completed on time, you can go back to court, you can again talk to the clerk and ask to restore the case, um, and if there's, a, if there's an order from the court, including a so ordered agreement, um, then it, you, can, you can ask for civil penalties, and contempt, and these are penalties, these are fines that go to the city, they don't go to you. Um, but that's, and, and this is very rare, I think, for pro se actions, but that's just sort of, on the back end, there are some enforcement mechanisms. Um, if you get that far down the line, calling a, like a legal services um, organization and talk, asking about your options um, would also be a good idea. So.
can do at the DHCR, right? That's called a reduction of services complaint. And that's for when your services get re reduced. Meaning, um, I live in an apartment. Uh, I have a refrigerator. That refrigerator is no longer working. I live in an apartment. I have a bathroom. I have a huge hole in my bathroom, uh, in my bathroom wall. Right? These are reductions in services. Right? I live in a building, and the elevator has been out of service for two months. Right? Um, I live in a building that has no gas. All of those things are reductions in services. Now, there are two types of complaints that can be filed. I'm just going to go here. So, the first complaint is called an individual apartment co complaint. And that's filed for, for your individual apartment, right? That's for conditions that are inside the apartment. Then there's also a building-wide services uh, complaint, right? And that's for services that are, that are located in the hallways, the roof, the common areas, the lobby, the elevator, the gas, right? Things that are building-wide. Now the nice thing about the, the back up the individual apartment complaint is only something that the, the tenant can do for for him or herself, right? The building wide complaint is great because you can you can roll that out at a tenant meeting, right? You can say, hey, all of us together, all of us together in this room who live in this auditorium are going to file a complaint together because um, because there's no lights in the auditorium anymore, right? And we, we pay rent for this auditorium. We want to have lights. We want to have a microphone that works. We don't want to have sound that's coming from the, from the speaker, right? So if I'm not getting all those services, all of us are going to sign on to a, a, a building-wide complaint to the D DACR. Now, there's some pros and cons, right? Um, the, the first con, the first, the, the, the pro, the, the benefit is you don't have to go to court, right? Which is for some people nice, right? Everything gets done through the mail. Um, you can get your rent lowered or, or frozen, right? Usually the, the DHCR will roll it back to the, to the last lease that was in effect. Um, the, the downside to this kind of complaint is that it is a very slow process. It can take six to nine months just to get a response. From the, from the DHCR, right? um, and it's not available if you live in a market rate apartment or uh, if you live in a New York City Housing Authority apartment. Um, so those are some those are some downsides. The one thing that I will say, it's this is a powerful uh, tool that we have. It freezes the rent on all of the apartments that sign on to it in the whole building, right? What's better than that, right? What compels a, a property owner to do repairs more than hitting them in their in their pockets, right? And it is very hard to lift it. The landlord has to file a separate proceeding, which you get notice of, and you can oppose that, right? So it can be kind of a nasty little hook that that um, that that you can use to push the landlord. Is it going to solve all of our problems? No, but it it can be a nice a nice tool. Yes, in the building. 
building up to par, right? Then the state sometimes, right, if we have a convincing case, the state can say, no, you know what, we don't grant this MCI, or we're not going to grant the MCI increase until all of those conditions have been taken care of, right? So it can be a useful tool. Also, because you brought this up, I think the harassment complaint at the DHCR or in housing court can be a useful tool, right? And now we have another useful tool, which is the certificate of no harassment, right? Which is going to be something that the tenant movement needs to latch onto and use and put it in their in their toolbox. Um, so thank you so much for bringing that up. That was a really strike 
and that can be a more powerful tactic, though there are similar risks involved. Um, so, how it works. So basically, you have to put the landlord on notice with, you know, with any of these, let them know the conditions that need repair in your apartment, um, do it in writing, do it so you can prove that you did it. Then, if it's not fixed, let the landlord know again in writing, certified, return receipt requested, that you will be withholding your rent until the repairs are fixed. And then you save all of your rent. And I mean all of your rent, because you don't, there's no law that, that there's no like repair and deduct law where you sort of spend your own and assume that, that, will, that the landlord will forgive that and allow that. Um, there's, there's nothing that protects you um, when doing this. So you can't rely on going to court and getting a significant rent credit, because that's the goal. So you notify your landlord, save all of your rent, and then you wait. And the landlord eventually um, starts an eviction case against you for not paying rent. And then once you're in housing court on the eviction case, um, as a sort of counterclaim, you know, it's kind of, that's where you get to explain that the reason you haven't been paying your rent is because of these conditions. Um, and, but you want to bring to court with you all of your rent because maybe the judge says, oh, okay, these conditions are significant. You know, you get 50% off. That's very rare. Maybe the judge says, oh, okay, you get, you know, 10% off. Maybe the judge says, these aren't housing violations. These aren't a big deal to me. I'm not giving you any rent abatement. And so you are you have to pay 100% of the rent that you've been withholding, or else you get evicted. So that's the sort of risk involved. Um, when you talk about save all your rent, do you mean formerly in a form of escrow account? Yeah. Right. So that is yeah, that is best. I think for, for some people that's um, people just keep them as money orders, just sort of you know hold on to them. Um, if you are doing it as a um, as part of a tenant association action, as part of a rent strike, um, if you then you want to create an escrow account and hold it in the escrow account. Did you have something to? Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, sometimes we, we we use the word like es escrow account. Um, an escrow account is just a bank account. Right. So you can like a tenant association can just put it in a bank in a, in a bank account that the tenant association. Or, um, or you can put it into your own, into your own. It doesn't have to be in, in an escrow account. An escrow account is a bank account that lawyers use to hold their clients' money. Yeah. Yeah. There's like ethical rules around not commingling. You know, you may not if the tenant association and the tenant leader says, "Oh, you know, I'll put it in my bank account." You know, maybe you don't want to. I'll do that. Maybe you want to open one account. You know, there's different ways of doing it. Um, but if you're just doing it on your own, having it in your own account, um, or having the money orders there ready to go. Um, so here are the pros and cons. This is a method that all tenants in New York City can use. You don't have to be rent stabilized. Um, there's none of that involved. Um, um, and unlike an HP, which just involves an order to correct the repairs, you may get a reduction in rent, so you might save yourself some money. Um, so that's kind of a pro that the HP doesn't have going for it. And then again, there's cons. So the con is, first of all, that there will be an eviction case started against you. And anytime there's an eviction case started against you, that's kind of a risky position to be in. Um, also, anytime your landlord sues you in housing court, anytime they start a case against you, there's a risk of ending up on the tenant blacklist. And the tenant blacklist is this sort of very problematic situation where the data and the information from the court system um, goes on this long list that then landlords like pay to have access to. And so next time, if you're ever in the position of having to look for another apartment, they could look you up, and if they see your name on that list, then you'll be kind of pegged as a, a troublesome tenant, a tenant who doesn't pay their rent, and that can be um, difficult. So there's a risk in terms of that. Um, the other thing is that the landlord chooses the time frame. If, if there's a horrible condition and you start withholding your rent and four months later the landlord still hasn't paid you, I mean still hasn't taken you to court, you've just been living with this condition for four months. 
So unlike an HP where you get to start the process, you just have to wait for the landlord to take you to court. Um, yeah, and then also the risk of eviction, and also what I said about there's no law guaranteeing that you're going to get an abatement, and so you have to be ready to pay everything over um, at that time. So harassment was the next topic, which brought up, which came up a little earlier, but that's. So this is just in, folks. I just got an important announcement. Um, so we're going to share the presentation with Senator Kruger's office, and and um, the senator's office will put it up on on the website and mail or email it to anyone who wants it. Um, so be sure to give us your inf information before you leave. The other thing is um, that we have to be out of here by 8.30, which is precisely 13 minutes from right now. Um, so we wanted to we so we have we have some slides on harassment and how to and how to organize a tenant association, but maybe if folks want to, I'm happy to just kind of like, like freestyle the rest of this. Maybe we can try to loop it into one big discussion that serves everyone, if that's possible to do. Can we get what we need on the... Sure. Yeah. Sure, as, as long as you're giving, uh, giving, giving us your, your information. Sorry. And we also have a lot of the information that's in the PowerPoint presentation is actually in this handout. We've got 40 copies of it, so, so there should be plenty for everybody. And this is just a handout, three ways to get repairs, and it lists these three different options and some um, some instructions. So we have these up here, and we can bring them down. Uh, that's not dealt with here, but it's 